Hello, I'm Josh Adams, head sommelier at Heston Vineyards in the Napa Valley. Welcome to our live streaming event. Uh, we're here in the Barrel Room at our seat in the Gordon Valley area of Napa at Heston Vineyards. Heston Vineyards is owned by Helen and Stanley Chang, whose primary business is owning and operating a cookware manufacturing business. But their love of wine in the Napa Valley led them to purchase this property in 1996 so that they could grow their own grapes and make their own wine label, Heston Vineyards which is actually named after our owners, uh, combining their first names, Helen and Stanley, to create the Heston Bay brand. Here at Heston Vineyards, the majority of our grapevines are Cabernet Sauvignon, planted on volcanic clay loam soils, but we do have a variety of other grapes grown here as well, including Malbec, which is what we'll be featuring today. Now, Malbec, we know, is native to Bordeaux, France, and is thriving in Argentina right now, but wine critic Robert Whitley says that our 2015 Stephanie Malbec rivals any of the finest Malbecs at Argentina can muster. Now we're gonna go into the kitchen and meet Julia Raffoni, who's cooking up something that is going to pair perfectly with our Stephanie Malbec. Let's go see what's cooking. I'm really excited to try the pairing of this Stephanie Malbec with Julia's risotto. Earthiness of this Stephanie Malbec and the risotto earthiness is going to pair really well together. Hi, Julia. Hi, Josh. Right, so Stephanie Malbec with the risotto. risotto. Which class would you like to pour in? Small one for the result, but a big one for me, please. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Benvenuti, welcome everyone. My name is Julia Ruffoni. I am the fourth generation Ruffoni family member um, to make these copper pots. And today I'm going to make a family recipe of radicchio risotto paired with um, Heston Stephanie Malbec. So we're going to start by looking at what ingredients we have. We have our risotto rice. This is carnaroli, which you have in the ingredients list on the recipe. You can use aborio, you can use yellow nano, any kind of risotto rice will do. We have our veg, of course. So we have uh, our red radicchio, which is a wonderful vegetable that's very popular in Italy in different shapes and forms, but it's started to come up quite often in uh, the US as well. If you can't find that, you can use in beans, you can use sorrel, any other kind of um, leafy, sturdy, yellow bitter vegetable. We have shallots. Again, yellow onions, um, white onions will also work. Our grated parmigiano reggiano. I was just Stephanie Malbec. Um, olive oil, and then I'm just going to get out of my fridge the bacon and the butter that were also in the list of ingredients. And the butter in particular, I'm keeping in the fridge because um, we want it to stay cool, and we'll talk later about why. So the last thing I have is my beef stock. Uh, you can use chicken if you prefer, or if you're making this recipe vegetarian, obviously vegetarian is, uh, stock is fine as well. I have it in my pot, and I'm going to turn that on. There we go. So that it starts heating up for when we need it. And having done that, I'll stop chopping my vegetables. So my first one is going to be the shallot. I haven't done the prep beforehand, so that hopefully you got the ingredients and you're cooking along with me. Um, if not, obviously make sure to subscribe to the channel and save the recipe so you can come back to it later. And if you have any questions at any point, please do interrupt, you know, send them in. Uh, I'd love to chat with all of you. So I'm peeling my shallot, and I'm going to slice this quite fine. The reason for this is that we don't really want to find big chunks um, that are oniony inside the risotto. We're just gonna want a very sweet, mellow flavor running through it. So, you know, do the best you can, but fairly fine would be preferable. The other thing we're gonna do to make sure that we don't have a lot of chunks of onion or shallot in there is going to be to use a slow, gentle flame. And it's not going to take that much longer, but it will be worth it. So I hope you can see it from over there, but maybe I'll lift up the board in just a second to show you. This is the how fine the shallot is. So we're going to set that aside. Clean up my workstation. Don't want to be messy. 
And the next thing we're going to prepare is the radicchio. So I gave the rest of the ingredients for um, two people. That's what I'm going to be making. So half a head really is sufficient. But obviously, if you're cooking for four people, you're doubling the recipe, you're going to make the whole thing. This vegetable, if you've had it home for a few days, you might have a bit of discoloration or wilting on the outside leaves. That doesn't mean it's gone bad. Just peel off one or two leaves, and it's perfectly fine. That's something I like about these kind of sturdy, more wintery vegetables that will really last a long time. I am ch chopping this much more roughly. Um, it will wilt in the pan, so it's it really doesn't have to be a precise cut. You just want pieces that are not too huge running through. And that is perfect. That's all the radicchio I need. Here we go. And now my last step is the bacon. Now, obviously, bacon is not in its, you know, in its American form part of the more traditional Italian recipe. But it doesn't matter. You know, we cook seasonally and we cook whatever ingredients are locally available. And so, you know, if I were in Italy, I would use pancetta, maybe guanciale, which is um, a wonderful piece uh, that's the traditional ingredient in carbonara. But the American bacon has a nice smokiness and it's what's easier to find here. So I'm going to be using that. I'm making fairly large chunks of this one because I do like finding a little bit of that smoky meatiness um, as little surprises for the result though. But um, that's really up to your personal preference. So I'm almost done chopping this, which I know takes a little bit of time. But really, this is the longest it's going to take for prepping the risotto. People think the risotto takes forever to make, that you have to stir it for hours. You'll see it's much faster and easier than people here. I'm going to wash the meat head. And we're going to start with our sofrito. Now, what I'll start with is a tablespoon or two of olive oil and a few pieces of butter in my pan, but you'll notice it's still cold. Copper will heat up very quickly, so there's no need to preheat it. Never preheat the uh, copper. We'll turn on a gentle flame, not to medium heat, and our butter is going to start melting very quickly. I can see it melting already. Now, in this case, I don't even need, you know, many times when you're doing this, you're waiting for the butter to foam and to melt it completely, maybe even brown slightly. We don't need that here. Uh, with sofrito, we're really kind of under frying. We're not trying to get your shallot to be crunchy. You're wanting to get very soft and melted. And so my butter is almost melted. It's a great time to go in with shallot. This is forming the base of our flavor here. So it is taking a couple of minutes that are really going to pay off at the end of the result. At this stage, um, again, as I said, you're really keeping the flame low, you're keeping your head in the shallot, I mean, it's very fine, and you're trying to soften it and make it go translucent without um, crisping it up. One trick that um, some chefs use when they're short in time is to add, uh, that one's really strong, is to add a little bit of salt to their onions or shallots, and what that does is it draws out the moisture so that um, it cooks faster. But you do risk it going a little bit too crunchy. So I would say if you do that, really keep a close eye on it, make sure it's not going too dry. Now this is softening, and I wish you to smell it. I hope you're cooking along and you are smelling it because it's really delicious. There's a few things like butter and onions, and and I keep calling this onion because typically onion is the, the base, this most common base for risotto in this case, but shallot, white bread, yellow onion, um, even um, leeks will all make a great um, flavor base. So this is perfect where I want it. I'm going to add my rice. Now for two people, you're adding about one cup of rice, obviously depending on how much you eat and how much you like it. Um, in my family, we've never measured rice in cups or even weight. We just go by the hand. And so um, it's going to be one and two handfuls for one person, and then one and two handfuls for the second person, including these for two people. And we always have one for the pot. I don't know why, we never scale it. It's always one for the pot, and somehow it always works out the way. At least that's how I learned the recipe from my mother. So what we're doing at this stage is that we are toasting the rice. And that sounds like the stock is definitely coming up to temperature. Between the stove, 
an empirical inductive cooper. It's going to be really fast. Now, what I'm doing right now is I'm toasting the rice. Um, this is a very important step. It only takes one or two minutes, but what it does is two things. One is that the rice will get a bit nutty in flavor, and that flavor will carry through into the final result. Though. The other thing is that we're sealing the rice a little bit. We'll notice that I've not raised my rice, and that's really important. Result is creamy, not because we add a ton of fat in cream and butter. We use some butter, obviously, but it's mostly because we um, use the starch that's naturally present in the rice and release that throughout the cooking. And so if, um, but we don't want to add too much of it either. And so that's why the toasting at the beginning allows us to seal the, um, the grain a little bit and just get it right. <clears throat> now, the way you know if this is um, getting through the right point, it's first of all, it's a minute or two, but really you're gonna get a sense for it. So you're gonna see the edges of the grain go a little bit translucent, and you're gonna start smelling it. Once you're smelling the toasted rice, that's when we go in with the wine. Julia, now, that copper yes. pot is beautiful. What is it? Um, this is our Symphonia Cupra Chef Pop. Um, uh, Chef Pop, actually, let me go in with the wine, and I'll tell you more about the shape in a second. Now, we always use wine in risotto to deglaze the pan from all of the flavor that's being created until now, but also to add a note of acidity that will cut through the creaminess of, of the risotto very nicely. Most often, we use white. It's a little bit more plain flavor. It's a little bit easier. It matches with more taste, and also, um, it doesn't color it. But in this case, this recipe specifically calls for... Um, and I'm going to lower that further. Look how fast this will be. Um, this uh, recipe specifically calls for red wine, and you'll see how well that matches with the barbecue. Now, I'm, the wine has, the alcohol is operated. We still have flavor, we still have the color, but the alcohol is no longer there, and you can smell that it's not coming off anymore. So I can start adding my stock. Now, my stock will go in one or two little pools at a time. And this is where people think it. Um, Risotto takes forever to cook and you have to stir it continuously. From this stage, we're going to be writing less than 15 minutes. So we add the stock, we stir it through, and then we'll let it on for a moment. And while that's doing its thing, I'm actually going to start with the last ingredients that I've not forgotten, which are our bacon and our barbecue. I will take my bacon and add it in the pan. And I know some of you will be horrified that pan is cold. There's nothing in it at all. I'll add my bacon. I'll add just a touch of olive oil for good measure. And then I'll turn it on. Now, the reason I'm doing that this way is because I don't want um, the bacon to sear too quick. If the bacon hits a pan that's already preheated, what you're going to get is a sear outside of it, and then the fat gets sealed, sealed inside, and it maintains a sort of chewiness, which I'm not looking for here. And so by putting in a cold pan and warming it up more slowly, I'm going to get the fat to naturally reduce and render, and I'm only going to have it um, nice and crispy. And yes, I think you were asking about the pan. So this is a chef pan. The reason for using a chef, so a chef pan is also known as essential pan, and I think it's definitely one of your most useful instruments in the kitchen. I make tomato sauce in it, I soak the vegetables in it, I start by braising meat and then, um, sorry, searing meat and then braising it slowly, and it's unbeatable for risotto. And what's so good about it is that it's kind of medium height, so you can add liquid, um, you can do more than you would do in just a fry pan. Look at that, our bacon is already starting to sizzle. Uh, you can do more than you would do in the surprise pan, but at the same time, it's not that tall, so, and it has this kind of rounded size, so it allows the liquid to evaporate quickly. Now, I will stir my bacon through and let it render just a little bit more. You'll notice here, I'm not stirring continuously. I'm adding a little of salt, I'm giving it a stir, and then I let it do its thing. If you have any other questions, please do let me know. Send them in the, in the messages. Um, we're very happy to answer anything that you've got. Listen to this bacon. Okay. 
that guy is almost ready. I can smell the, the smokiness of it. The sizzling is beautiful. The fat is rendering. And so I'm almost ready to add my ready to eat it. And I don't have to use a separate pan because you start the bacon in here at the beginning with the onion and you could add the ready food directly into the risotto. But what this allows me to do is control the way it's cooked very well. And I don't want the, the leaves to wilt too much and go very soft. I want them to retain a little bit of the light. So this allows me to do just that. And so I'm stirring them through. I have to say, the stove is fantastic and it's very powerful. Especially when you're cooking with your copper, you really have to dial down the heat that you would normally be using. Over here. I think we're ready for another reel. Okay. And I'll keep going. We're going to be doing this for another, like, maybe eight or nine minutes. We'll taste it and we'll check. But while we do this, so keep an eye on that, add the other stock, stir it through. Maybe um, we can learn a little bit more about this more better use. I'm actually going to. Turn the radicchio off. You will see that the color has gone a little bit darker than the white hunter pieces of soften. And so I'll just turn these flame off. And I'd love for Josh to tell us more about the moment. Absolutely. Thank you, Julia. So we are featuring our 2015 Stephanie Molbeck uh, to pair with the radicchio risotto that Julia is cooking. Uh, this Stephanie Molbeck is made from grapes grown right here at Heston Vineyards. And our Stephanie wines are all named after Helen and Stanley's daughter, Stephanie, who is the youngest of three children and a very talented harpist. So you will see a golden harp on every single one of Stephanie's bottles. Uh, this Stephanie Malbec and all of our Stephanie wines are made by winemaker Jeff Gaffner, who's been working with us since 2005. This, this mall back here is aged for 28 months in French oak barrels, and we produced only 400 cases of this Stephanie mall back in 2015. Uh, now we're gonna try the wine, if you wanna try it along with me. In smelling this wine, this is gonna have some beautiful aromas of violet, beautiful bouquet. Very floral. And then tasting the wine, I get some very bright fruit, some ripe blackberries, really bright, fresh blueberries. And it has a super soft finish to it as well. Very soft, smooth tannins. But it does have some nice earthiness to it, which is why we're pairing it with Julia's Radicchio Risotto today. Julia, how's it going? It's going very well. I tasted the wine when we were talking about it. And I wouldn't probably be able to describe it quite so thoroughly, but it does taste delicious. So I really hope you have a bottle of that at home as well. Um, I've had a chance to try a few of the Hessen wines, and they're very spectacular. So I hope you're keeping an eye on your risotto. You should have been adding stock along the way, whisk it through, let it cook. And I think we're doing pretty well. It's only going to be a few more minutes. Our ready to is ready here for us. And I think we might have more questions. Glenn? So does, uh, Julia, what type of rice are you using for risotto and why? Right. Um, so I mentioned this is a uh, carnaroli. We can use arborio, we can use gallon, and I know what we're not using is some of those long grain, um, kind of like basmati rice. And the reason is one something that's a little bit shorter and stubbier and it has more um, starch on it. Because that's actually what we're using to build the risotto. It's going to give us that creaminess together with the slow stirring motion. and the very even, even heat conducting um, cooper. You can do this in, in other cooper, obviously, but um, the result is really something where uh, a pot that is, that is heat conductive will shine because it will make all of the grains cook at the same time. If you do this in something that is, you know, very, a very bad barrier to heat, you're going to have the rice burning at the bottom while it's still sitting raw at the top. And so you're going to have to stir continuously to prevent that which in turn will release too much starch and will make it go gluey. You, you know when you've made a risotto and the flavors are right, but the consistency is not there, it's it's like a, a glue 
Um, that's what's most likely has happened is that you've um, oversteered it and going too much uh, starch up. This guy is beautiful and it's ready to be added in. So for the ridicule, I am going to add a little bit of uh, pepper to it. I am actually not soaking it right now because I don't want it to release its water. The one to right now, it's going to get dissolved from moving the rice. And in terms of salt, um, it will really depend on the kind of stock that you're using. Um, I use um, kind of a bone broth and that didn't have salt in it, so I'm going to be adding quite a bit to adjust that along with the cheese. But obviously, if you make your own stock, which obviously recommend if you have the time for it, if you use the stock that's richer in salt, you might not have to add any salt. So that's why when we're almost ready, we paste them as for salt. We're almost done, you guys. This is really close to being ready. And again, hope you're putting it on because the smells are fantastic. But please repeat it later on if you if you didn't. You can find the video on Heston's YouTube channel. Um, do subscribe there. They're going to be sharing more content in the coming time for sure. And for Rufoni, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, um, even Pinterest, it's always Rufoni official. So you'll find us in any platform of your Julia, what type of pan is this and why is it shaped like that? Um, so this is the chef pan, the essential pan, which has the rounded sides, um, they go up. This specific one um, is called Symphony Cupra and it has stainless steel lining inside as well as this um, stainless steel handle, which you'll notice I'm holding with my bare hands. Obviously, you always recommend to use oven lids, especially if you're going to be putting your cooper in the oven, but um, this is staying pretty curly cool at the end. And it has our um, logo, you know, a little copper coin at the end. And that was my father's way of signing it as, uh, as he made it. Um, this has, copper always has a lining inside. This one, as I mentioned, has stainless lining, which is, it's an easier one for someone who's starting to put in copper and maybe they're not quite used to it. It's more forgiving. We, Rufoni is known for our thin line copper, our historic collection, which obviously has a special place in my heart, but um, it's both really good. So we have both of them, as well as our flat stainless steel material on our new website, which is rufoni.net. And actually, this might be a good time to say that if you didn't see that in the newsletter that went out from Hashtag, if you're joining us some other way, we did have a promo code called um, Heston 31 We gave you 15% off our old power cooker on our website. And it was going to end today, but I think we're going to be extending it a few more days because this really inspired you to, to make your own result at home. So just leaving that out there for you. So one more question, Julia. About how many cups of stock did you use in this recipe? Um, I want to say this was three cups. Um, it's always a little bit looking at it and judging. You can, if you feel that you're running out when you're almost done, you can easily add a little bit of hot water. You, as long as your stock was good, you've added a lot of flavor in there, that's not gonna mess with it. Um, it depends because of the size of the pan and how hot the heat is. In this case, I had, you know, some days almost spill over at the beginning. So I might be a little bit short in, in stock. Three to four cups should do it. I'm gonna taste the rice because I think we're close to done and the best way of knowing if it's ready is just to taste it. And we are in fact close to done. I'm going to adjust for salt. Mm -hmm. As I said, my stock was um, not salted, so it does need a fair bit more. Josh, we're getting some questions about the Heston Vineyards Malbec and where people may be able to get it. Absolutely, you can purchase this 2015 Stephanie Malbec at our website, hestonvineyards.com, and any of our uh, Heston, Stephanie Meyer, and Vincent Christopher wines. All right, thank you, Josh. Um, I actually think we're ready with this rice. So remember, you don't want this to go too soft, too soggy. Um, you're still maintaining a little bit of al dente consistency. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn plain, plus plain soft. 
adding um, all of our beautiful flavors that we made on the side. And so stirring this radicchio and this bacon, stir this through thoroughly. And then the last bit of magic is called mantecatura. So we have done the sofrito with the onion, we have toasted the rice, we've been cooking it through for about 30 minutes, maybe even less than that. And now we're going to add quite a bit of Parmigiano cheese and some cold butter. And it really helps if it's cold because it's um, going to emulsify better. So what we want is the cold of the fat with the, um, the water of the stock of the rice to emulsify with each other because that also helps for the creamy consistency. And so stir that through vigorously. And if you didn't have the last little bit of stock, um, make sure that there is enough water in there to actually do this emulsifying. Remember that it will continue cooking just for a tiny bit um, after we've turned off the flame. So make sure you're not kind of get dry up too much because that would be really good. And I think we're ready to start. Julia, as we're getting closer to finishing the risotto, can you show the audience the what's in the pan? Oh, <laughs> Let's see. Here we go. Let me get some in a plate um, and see if I've been successful with this. So the consistency that we're going for with risotto is called alonda, the way. And the reason is you don't want this like super dense mass in the middle of the plate that just won't move. And you also don't want the soup with rice that just boiled inside it. Um, and you know it's pretty good if you put it in the middle of a flat plate and you bang out the bottom of it and it spreads out flat. And the reason you want it to spread out that way is so you have more surface going more from each other. I think that's pretty good. I'm going to add a little bit of parmigiano. You never have too much. Josh, would you like to taste this? Absolutely, I would love to. Thank you, Julia. Delicious, very rich and creamy. I know some people will have their doubts about pairing using a, such a good wine inside cooking. But I think you really get to experience some of the outfits, fruit and some of its aromas in the glass and on the plate. What do you think, Josh? It really is the perfect pairing, the small back in your ridiculous oven. So thank you. Fantastic. And if you're enjoying this live stream as much as I'm enjoying Julia's risotto and this Heston wine together, please subscribe to Heston Vineyards on YouTube. So good. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye.